Good morning. I would invite you to bring your moms to a special event that we're putting on on June 8th at this church from 6 to 8, and it's called a Friends Razor. Many of you in this church are our friends, and many of you have no idea what we do. You've just heard of Becoming What God Intended Ministries. So part of that evening, we'll be explaining what we do. Is that what you do? <laughs> I hope I wasn't responsible for that. <laughs> Yes. So, we're involved, for example, we're involved in China. And many of you can't help but have an interest in China politically, but also there's a great reason to be involved with China spiritually. We have a pool of a thousand students in China that we make our five courses that we specialize in. We specialize in spiritual life development. And these thousand students are church leaders, pastors, missionaries, Christian counselors. And I would say, and I'll talk about this next week, that the Christian movement is probably the most significant thing going on in China today and probably one of the least spoken about realities in that country. So we'll be talking about that. We'll also be sharing about some wonderful, wonderful things that have come into the life of becoming what God intended and what we're doing in Asia, Australia, Hong Kong, obviously China, North America, Europe. More than that, that evening we'll be having light refreshment and because we're involved in so much in Asia it'll be dim sum if you're not familiar with that it's great Chinese food and so that'll be available that evening but we'd love to have you come first of all just to be aware of what we do then secondly you might want to pray, you want, might want to participate, you might want to support. After the service, the most charming man at Creekside, Jerry Grassi, and our executive director, Gail Incarnation, and if both of them will stand, and there is the most charming man. <laughs> They'll be at the visitor's booth collecting names, and he will charmingly insist that you come. <laughs> and then, and Gail will be taking the information. So, let me see. That is up there. And we'll be talking again about the beauty of the Trinity. The beauty of the Trinity. And the topic this morning is the beauty of the Holy Spirit. We've seen as we've gone along that the Father wants your company forever. The Father, God the Father, genuinely wants your company forever. And he has given the Son to guarantee that you will have the Father's company forever. In a very simple proposition, he did this for the earth. In John 3.16, it says, and this is my translation, for in this way, God delighted in the people of the world. God has a profound enjoyment of human beings <clears throat> and a profound compassion for human beings in the problems <clears throat> that exist on this planet. As a result, so that he gave the only begotten son. Now he gave the only begotten son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. 
but there was a particular opportunity that was attached to the cross. And, and this is so incredibly important. Satan's a dictator. Satan's a killer. He is nasty. God the Father is a gentleman and he does not impose his will, especially when it involves his son. So he gave his son on the cross with the result that every particular one believing in him, this is a very accurate translation of John 3.16, with the result that every particular one believing in him will not perish forever and will have eternal life. And he gave his resurrected son the responsibility of keeping us saved forever. Not only did he give him on, give him on the cross, he gave him as our protector. Then the second sermon was on the son's love. We are affectionately loved by the father. We are affectionately loved by the son. And in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays to the father so that we are grounded and founded on the love of Christ. It's interesting. <clears throat> Many of us don't realize the level of affection that God has for you. Not only because you're made in his image, not only because he designed you to be the person you are, but because you're unique in his eyes and there is a depth of affection similar to the affection he has for the son and there's a depth of affection from Christ for us that is the kind of affection that the father and son share. So, in verse 18 and 19 of Ephesians 4, it says this, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, the multi-dimensioned love of Christ, to personally know it, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Here's a brutal reality. God has a fullness for every human being. And, and there is a brutal reality. We can only know this fullness if we have a sense of being enjoyed by God. Otherwise, we're serving a dictator. Otherwise, we're serving a master we don't know. But if we have a sense of being under the affection of God the Father and God the Son, then the fullness of God can enter into our life. Because the Trinity is inviting us to a deep and profound relationship. John 15, 9 says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Don't work for my love. My love will always be there. But abide in my love. Notice the quality of love. The quality of love that the Father has for the Son is directed at us. This is incredibly important. Because it means that as a human being, we are invited to participate in the life and the love of <clears throat> the Trinity. John 17, 23, Jesus is speaking to the Father. I in them, I will exist within them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in one, brought into a deep unity, so that the world may personally know that you sent me and loved them. Because the greatest witness for Christ is a smile of a contented human being. A contented human being is a miracle of God. 
It's not produced by this culture. It's not produced by this world. A contented and happy human being almost is diseased when it comes to this planet. What's wrong with you? So, that the world may personally know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Do you know what that is saying? That is saying that the relationship with the Father and Son is the relationship that we step right into. And now we're going over to the role of the Holy Spirit, the beauty of the Holy Spirit. And as we look at this, you're going to have to tolerate me because I'm essentially a language teacher. I taught Hebrew at a seminary for 25 years. That should make me the most boring person on the planet. <laughs> so I'm going to inflict on you some of the boredom that I have passed on to others. <clears throat> and I've also taught Greek for many years. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses, in 13, verses 13 and 14, a Semitic word occurs that's been brought over into Greek. It's spelled in Greek, and it's pronounced Arabon. But it's actually a Semitic word. It's in the Hebrew language, it's in the Canaanite language, and the Canaanites and the Phoenicians are the same group, and that word, Arabon, common word. And it's so common that it actually entered into Greek and it entered into Latin. Let's take a look how it's used here, and I have Arabone up on the text, because it's a pretty unique word. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes, In him, referring to Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, after believing... You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of the promise, the promised Holy Spirit. And you were sealed in him. Once you believed, you were sealed. So the question would be, how many times do you have to believe the gospel to be sealed? It comes down to once, because right after you believe, you're sealed. And what does a seal mean? It's a mark of protection. It's a mark of ownership. As soon as you believe the gospel that the Son of God, deity himself, has died on your behalf in a human body, and he was raised from the dead, boom! The Holy Spirit puts a stamp on your heart, which is probably in the shape of a heart, and says, you belong to God, and you will be protected by God, and I am your protector in this world. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of the promise, who is given as an Arab bone of our inheritance with a view to the redemption or full release of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Marvelous event worthy of praise. Arab bone, what is it? Well, the Canaanites were merchants, and they went all over the Mediterranean world buying and selling goods to make a profit. And when they agreed to buy wheat in Egypt or textiles in Italy, they would give a down payment, and it was called an Arab bone, a down payment. And the deal was this. They would say, at harvest time, we will come. You've reserved a part of the harvest for us. And if we don't show up, you keep the down payment. Or if they agreed to buy textiles in Italy. And after the contract was made, they would give a payment, an arabone, a percentage of the full cost. And then they would say, if we don't show up to pick it up, you just keep the money. It's an Arabon. So it passed into the Greek language from the Canaanite language, the Hebrew language, 
And it means an irreversible down payment. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Are we so far gone that God has to give the third member of the Trinity to give us confidence? Well, we are. We're that far gone. We have to be given the Holy Spirit as an irreversible down payment. And if God doesn't take us to heaven, you're stuck with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> which is a strange thought to begin with. But it means that God wants to win our confidence. Now catch this. The Father gave the Son and the Spirit as a payment for us. Our gifts from the Father. The first gift is his Son on the cross and his Son as our protector. And that relates to him because the issue of sin in the universe is satisfied through Christ. The issue of human sin is satisfied and all that remains is will a human being accept the compliment of having God die for that person? And there is an incredible amount of people who are blinded by Satan that the greatest compliment they've ever received was on the cross of Christ, where God, in effect, stated, we are worth dying for. We are worth dying for. He gave the Son for us as a payment on the cross, and then astonishingly, he turns around and gives us the down payment of the Spirit so that we'll have confidence towards him and what he's doing. It's incredible. God, the God of heaven and earth, gives the third member of the Trinity to us as down payment to say, I'll follow through, I'm not a liar. Oh my goodness. He wants us to trust him in the worst way because without trust, relationships don't exist. Is it not astonishing that all, get, that all that gets a person into heaven is one act of trust? That's how suspicious we are. God says, just give me one. Can't ask you for two. That might be a little bit difficult. But I'll ask you for one. And then in a joyous reciprocity, a joyous reciprocity out of love, he, the Father, gave the Son for us to believe, and out of reciprocity, out of a response to that, we believed. We believe, and that's our reciprocal response. Then, out of love, he guarantees, he gives a reciprocal response to us. Out of love, he guarantees our salvation by union with the Son. We're joined to the new humanity with the head, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And we're given the down payment of the Spirit. Now, the word Arabone occurs three times in the New Testament. And we'll be looking at the third use, but a middle use is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And notice carefully how it's written. Now he, referring to God the Father, notice how the Trinity is woven into this. One of the horrible things, and, and frankly it's disgusting, but the amazing thing is not too many people are disgusted about it. Normally in a church, in churches all over the world, evangelical churches, you either get one-third of the Trinity or two-thirds, but most churches don't have a full Trinity. They either specialize in the Spirit, specialize in the Son, and just like in the American home, American dads are absent. Seemingly within churches, they're used to not having dads around. 
They don't mention the Father at all. Or they pray to the Spirit, they pray to the Son, and they miss the fact that Christ himself ordered us to pray to the Father. It's a ridiculous, it's a horrible situation. It's downright shameful. It's disgusting. But it's so normal that people don't go, what happened to a fulsome trinity? What happened to it is Satan. He wants to discolor God so that we don't discover the beauty of what God has done for us. Because notice 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ, this is referring to God the Father, and anointed us is God. He sent the Holy Spirit to anoint us, who also sealed us through the Spirit, and gave us the Spirit in our hearts. Notice the Son, notice the Spirit, as an arabone. They're all connected together, doing different things for us. Now let's go over to another section. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Now, he who prepared us for this very, very purpose is God who gave to us the Spirit as an bone. Now, if you read chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 4, what it's talking about is kicking the bucket, dying. And it's talking about dying and having the tent of our earthly body dissolve and then going to heaven and being enveloped with an eternal tent. Going from earth to heaven and landing in heaven. And Paul talks about the wonder of landing in heaven, having a body there for us waiting. But it's really about the promise to the believer that when you die, you do not pass go, but you go directly to heaven. You don't go to purgatory, you go to heaven. Because salvation is not based on what you do, but what God has done for you. And to guarantee that we get to heaven when we die, he gave us the spirit as an unredeemable down payment. But let's take a look at the whole passage that goes on from there because it has a fascinating comment that I can't help smiling about now and I hope you'll be smiling when I get to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Now he who has prepared us to go to heaven for this very purpose is God who gave us the Spirit as an air bone. Therefore, being always of good courage, we're not afraid of death, and knowing that we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't see him, but we trust him. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. I am sick and tired of making trips to Kaiser. (laughs) My wife and I seem to switch off months to go to Kaiser. And and I think it's a great, Kaiser is a great preparation for heaven. (laughs) The waiting room and all that, at least when you go to heaven is quick. And so Paul says, hey, this is a great thing. You kick off, you go to heaven. And we should be rather confident about it. To be at home with the Lord. Then he continues on. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home, on earth, in the body, or absent, up in heaven, with the Lord, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive 
for the things done through the body, according to what he has practiced, whether good or bad. Now, notice the asterisk on bad. There is this famous, if you're into languages, the Greek language of the Bible, there's this famous book by Archbishop Trent, an English bishop, who was a wonderful specialist in language, and it's called the synonyms of the New Testament. A synonym are words that are related but different, such as evil, wretched, bad, sinful. They're all synonyms, all synonyms. But what he did in the book was to say, even though words are synonymous, they frequently carry a different variety of meaning. Aren't you glad you're here this morning? <laughs> you may not have caught it when you heard about synonyms in English class, but now is the moment of opportunity. <laughs> synonyms. And he wrote this book, and it's the coolest book going. And I looked up the Greek word, for a guy like me, it's the coolest book going. I looked up the Greek word phalos, which is the Greek word for bad. And, and I read what he wrote about it, and I broke out laughing. He said the essence of this word phalos, the word that's bad up in the text, is good for nothingness. Good for nothingness. <laughs> now, here's a guy who writes beautiful English, knows Greek, knows Hebrew, knows Latin, knows German, knows French, and he comes up with the phrase to define a word, good for nothingness. And he says, that's what's being talked about here. Whether you are good, beneficial, positive, great Christian, or if you're a good-for-nothing Christian, you're going to land in heaven. And then you'll have a conversation with Jesus Christ, with the most caring, loving person you'll ever meet, who died for us, by the way. And he's going to reward us for what we've done right. And the good-for-nothingness Christian is going to be already glorified, made like Christ, pure, have a home in heaven. Isn't this encouraging? That if you're a good-for-nothing Christian, you'll make it anyway? <laughs> Best news of the morning. Because your good-for-nothingness doesn't interfere with the greatness of what Christ did on the cross. His death is more important to God than our sin. And then when we become believers and he wants us to live like Christ and we live good for nothing, the value of what Christ has done and the love of the Father is sufficient to get us to heaven. And then we'll have an honest conversation with our Savior and we'll be rewarded. Now I want to go to another passage which deals with this good for nothingness thing. It's very important. Because once we realize we're not supposed to be in a slave-master relationship, but a beloved child of God relationship, once we realize we don't have the burden of keeping ourselves saved, but we're in this triangulated work of grace and beauty, it frees the heart to serve out of genuine gratitude and real sympathy for people because the experience of the father's and son's love is the greatest liberation that exists. But let's talk about this good for nothingness. Paul in 1 Corinthians, a book before, in chapter 3 verse 12 starts out and he's talking about being paid a wage for serving Christ. And he says there's good for nothing work for Christ, and there's good for something work for Christ. And he writes, now if any man builds on the foundation which is Christ, 
with valuable gold contributions, silver contributions, precious stone contributions, or wood, hay, straw, worthless stuff, worthless stuff, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it. There'll be a honest evaluation by the Savior of what we've done for the Savior. It's not an evaluation of our sins, it's an evaluation of our service, because our sins are paid for. We're not going to have a, I can, I can remember a preacher doing this. I was a teenager and I went to a uh, teenage conference and remember overhead projectors? Overhead, pro uh, that man with the white beard over there remembers overhead projectors. You and I were probably very similar in age. We remember, if you don't remember overhead projectors, that's all right, you've missed one of the great <laughs> inventions of mankind. Anyway, the overhead projector would project on a big screen like that, and what he said is, when you get to heaven, all your sins will be put on the overhead projector, the great overhead projector of heaven, and God will talk to you about all of your sins. At that point, I thought, I surely don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I don't care about how happy heaven is. If that's the front door, don't let me in. I, I, and then as I learned the Bible, I thought that was horrible manipulation and an insult to the cross of Christ. Christ paid for our sins, period. That's the way it is. But our service will be evaluated because God's honest and he wants to pay a wage to us of all things. A wage for what we've done for him. But if it's junk, no wage. Good for nothing. Then he goes on to say this. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a wage <laughs> of all things. God the Son feels he owes us for what we've done for him positively on this earth. Incredible. Incredible. But you have to remember, the Trinity doesn't think the way Sick human beings think, full of graciousness, gentlemanly, compassionate, understanding, holy, and righteous. He will receive a wage. If any man's work is burned up, fire is used as an illustration of the illustration of the process. Gold, silver, precious stones will survive fire easily. Would a stubble, boom, it's gone. Richard Nixon and his tapes, he would have loved to have had his tapes burned up. Well, our paltry works for Christ will be burned up. It won't be around in heaven to remind us of stuff. He will suffer loss, but notice how straightforward Paul is. But he himself will be saved, will be saved. The Holy Spirit is the non-redeemable down payment to assure us of our salvation. Whether we are good for nothing or good for something, now, here's where it gets very, very important. And if you're drifting off, come on back, because this is where it gets really important. Because we have a choice about how we respond to good for nothing. And the Christian life, first of all, is meant to be a life of gratitude and responsive love. The way the Christian life is designed is we're supposed to be overwhelmed by what Christ and God the Father have done for us and what the Holy Spirit means to us. We should be overwhelmed and have a growing sense of gratitude that leads to responsive love and we begin to participate in the life 
of the church, the life of the body of Christ on the earth. But there's another way to react to a sense of being good for nothing. And that is to have guilt over being good for nothing and then become a performance-based Christian. In China, the huge issue for the churches is the culture is so performance-based that the church just drinks it in by the gallons. And they have this horrible fear that God is always angry with them. That's why our work in China is so important. We're giving them an alternative view called the gospel, called the truth of the graciousness of God. But if it leads to performance, just performance, there's a problem. Because performance without a loving response is good for nothing. The person who feels good for nothing about serving Christ has a problem. If they begin to feel guilty and they go out to do something because they're doing it by guilt, it's a waste of their time because they haven't slowed down enough to understand how deeply we are loved. Instead, they think, I've got guilt. It's like a dog who has one of those electric collars around their fins, around their neck, around their neck. And when they do something wrong, they're jolted. Well, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is to be moved by love. And Paul says that a Christian who's responding to guilt and who actually sacrifices their life, it's a waste of time because they have failed to understand What a wondrous place we are in. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, I become a martyr. But do not have love, it profits me nothing. Could you imagine a martyr looking at the judgment seat of Christ, and he has given his life for Christ, and Christ says, you get nothing for that because it wasn't motivated correctly. You're just doing it out of guilt. That's what all religions do. Guilt, 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 guilt. Guilt, 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 guilt. Greatest manipulation force on the planet. Guilt, 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 guilt. While the great motivation force for believers is loving gratitude. So how do we respond to the son's love? In John 15, 19, we've already referred to this. It says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. It doesn't say, work for my love, gain my love. It says you have it. And it doesn't say, If you don't abide in the circle of that love, you lose it because we're assured at what we've looked at that we're under the love of God. But what it is saying is our job is to be Christians who know they're profoundly loved by the Father and the Son. And if you don't know that as a Christian, your first responsibility is to spiritually find that out. Because otherwise, what you do for God is a waste of time. It'll be from fallacious motivation. That's being about as blunt as it can be. If we don't slow down and discover the depth of love that we're involved in, any motivation, other motivation we have is just plain fallacious meeting psychological needs, dealing with guilt, dealing with shame, serving God out of the wrong reasons is a waste of time. There'll be plenty of good-for-nothing Christians in heaven. But how do we become good for something? We discover how deeply we are loved. We don't fill out the rest of John 15, 9 like this. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love by becoming a performance-based, 
guilt-driven Christian. That is not how we do this thing. So, what's the proper way to do it? Enter into the loving delight of God. Now, today is Mother's Day. Why do we like mothers? My brothers and I adored our mom. (laughs) Our dad was an alcoholic, so we weren't too excited about him. But we adored our mom. She was great. Do you know why? She thought we were great. (laughs) She liked us. She talked to us. I had a mom, when I would come home from high school, she literally would talk to me an hour when I got home. And she was always interesting, very bright, great conversationalist, caring person. And she had this magic thing. She liked me. And when five brothers are being liked, there's a natural thing that occurs. We all want to be the favorite. (laughs) And I found out something horrible later in life. My older brother was mom's favorite. (laughs) But she disguised it so well that we all thought we were her favorite. Moms, good moms are great because they make you feel special. And we want to do things for them to respond. God has a loving delight in us. He likes you. He values you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And his son died for us. So it's a loving delight And our response needs to be a response of delight. We love because he first loved us. What we need to do is to remain in the love that God has placed around us, on us, and respond to it. John 15, 9. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Don't earn it. Relish it. Don't leave it because it'll pursue you, but you'll have an ineffective, good-for-nothing Christian life. I have also loved you. Abide in my love. So we're in the third sermon of this series called The Beauty of the Trinity. And what should we remember? The Father wants your company forever. The Son guarantees the Father's company forever. The Spirit is the Father's guaranteed down payment on heaven. On heaven. And so again, please visit with the most charming man in this building and visit our executive director. We'd love to have you there. I would love to have everybody in this room understand what's happening in China, what we're doing in China, and the most important movement in China, which is Christianity. I'll mention more of that later on. And now we have... Uh, Somebody follows me, that fellow.